He's going to be a few minutes late. Thank you, Carol. Can we stand for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm trying to see who's new from last time. Thank you for joining. Uh, we're continuing our 2020-21 proposed superintendent's operating budget review this evening. Uh, before I turn the meeting over to Adam, who's the chair of the Finance Committee, um, I think we added on a couple items tonight and pushed a couple items into Thursday night because there's so much detail covered. We didn't want to keep you guys here until midnight, uh, as fun as that might be for Vincent. So I think we're going to go over uh, the remainder uh, of the, the budget, as well as some uh, fee discussion, presentation around facilities and sports programs. So that'll take a good, good chunk of this evening. That being said, welcome. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Finance Chairman, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Massiana has a presentation, uh, if you'd like. It worked. Good evening. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to everyone who's new tonight. So I would say I'm going to be brief this evening, but I know that's just wasting time because nobody's going to believe me anymore. We do have um, you know, several different presentations that we are going to walk through this evening, and I'm going to just um, jump right in. So this is our second workshop session. Um, the items that are covered under this budget review are instructional expense, which includes special education services, support services, maintenance, and operations. So within the context of tonight's presentations, um, we'll be touching on all of those topics. But we will be covering athletics and athletic fees specifically, as well as building use in the early part of tonight's discussion. So I just wanted to let everyone know that. Nothing has changed. The budget request, as we presented um, last week and as superintendent presented, the budget request for 2021 is 76,330,052. That's an increase of 4.05% or 2,973,541. As far as the assumptions that we use to build this budget, there is no changing in staffing based on enrollment. Our enrollment is going down by about 47 students next year. Um, however, special education enrollment, that is increasing and the needs are increasing. So there's a request that's within the budget of um, two special ed teachers part-time, one for Darcy Kindergarten and one for the Quinnipiac, and Quinnipiac University and Transition Program, a half-time board-certified behavioral analysis, um, as well as on the non-certified staffing side, we're looking to add a .8 math interventionist for Dodd, as well as hall monitors at Norton and Chapman. Again, this was presented. I'm just um, doing a quick overview. Um, medical benefits is a big portion of this year's budget requests so that we have contributions that are in line with our expected claims for next year. And we have also a modest increase requested in operations and maintenance. Everything that we do uh, within our budget is grounded within the goals that we have for the school system. And I know everyone has seen this before, but complex thinking and social emotional learning are really the, the key uh, goals that we have in our district. Um, and we've had for several years and continue to fulfill on those goals. So <clears throat> the um, first, I'll call it, sub-presentation tonight is on um, Cheshire Public School Athletics. And I'm going to start with just a, an overview of what's built within our operating budget as it relates to extracurricular. So this is not just sports. This would be 
sports, robotics, music. And this comes from several different accounts, so I just wanted, for the board's reference, that left-hand column that says account, if you want to look and see where stipends or where music instructor expenses are budgeted in the back of the budget book, you would look in those two sections. Um, and we total this up for 2018-19, which is the last full year, which is one of the columns in your budget book. So those expenses were 619982 If we then look at the bus transportation related to extracurricular, that's 237680 And you could see that the costs are in descending order from highest to lowest. Um, facility fees that we pay for rental of the town pool, hockey, ski, and golf, total 68143 And you could see that it's 33000 for the pool, 27411 for hockey, and so on with uh, ski and golf. Account 611, that supports the purchases that are made. Um, and in this case, sports, robotics, and music, total 56919 um, And that's just the high school. DOT is a little bit below where it says DOT purchases for sports, 3929. Um, we do have an athletic trainer and supplies, about 41800 uh, Student accident insurance, we as a school district purchase student accident insurance for our intramural and our um, competitive sports. So that would protect not only the students, but it would protect the school district in the event of uh, student injuries that occur during the um, extracurricular activities. Whenever we have um, games of a certain size, we do pay for ambulance and police coverage. That's the 15506 And then the last item, Cheshire High School sports physicals. Um, we were paying um, a doctor to come in and do those sports physicals, but we no longer do that as of this year, you know, just to provide overall better coverage for those students. Those students have to get their own physicals if they're participating in Cheshire High School sports. So if you total that up, a million seventy-two thousand is what we spent in 1819 out of our budget related to extracurricular activities. Um, there's, what I'm not showing here is any offsets from participation fees and other things that will come as we go through the rest of this presentation. But I just wanted to give the board a sense for what it was in 1819. The budget for this year and the proposed budget for next year um, is in that same range. It's, it's not a dramatic difference in any one of those categories. So I'm providing this as a backdrop, and now we're going to move into um, Title IX. As, as the board knows, we recently had a Title IX um, complaint or a claim that we might have been in violation of Title IX as it relates to Cheshire, uh, Cheshire High School's girls hockey. And I'm going to need some assistance from Tracy Nolan Hussey, who um, not only is our director of pupil personnel here in Cheshire, but she's also our Title IX coordinator. I'll be on the sideline. result of um, the investigation that we've conducted and presented to the superintendent for his review as well as bringing it to you the board uh, so a little bit of background about title nine um, it is overseen by um, OCR and that's the Office of Civil Rights uh, and basically it um, it's a guidance point to accessibility and equality um, basically, athletics comes into play under Title IX with OCR, and they provide guidance as far as um, what you need to consider in order to determine something as a sport. 
Um, and uh, some of those considerations, you know, are structure, um, scheduling, uh, com competitions. Um, you know, they look at the idea that, uh, you know, there has to be, you know, certified coaching. There has to be access to those services and um, the athletic training support. Uh, there's a lot of different considerations. So districts use that as guidance to determine if the sports or clubs that they're offering um, fit the criteria um, that, that Title IX would fall under um, through the guidance of OCR. Uh, now sports, it doesn't mean, um, there's several things that they look at. So um, when we talk about Title IX compliancy with athletics, um, there's three factors that they kind of look at. Um, one being uh, equality by percentage. So when you're looking at your participation rate, uh, you would want to look at your male and female participation rate, um, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be an equal number of male, fe uh, male to female athletes. It means that it has to be an equal participation by your current enrollment of male and female. So it's a formula. Um, so OCR does sometimes uh, allow and guide districts to consider that there might be a natural uh, fluctuation with that percentage rate. Um, you know, we were able over a five-year trend uh, that Mr. Trafone presented to us about participation rate. We were able to see that fluctuation with several years being female athletes participating at a a higher percentage, um, but the participation is defined not by individual athletes, but that whole roster. Um, so one of the things that you have to take into consideration is we have a lot of students who are on more than one sport. So each sport that we're on counts towards that total number, okay? Um, when these types of claims come in, uh, you know, the district does have a Title IX coordinator, that's, that's my role, um, but then also we have Title IX coordinators um, in our buildings, which they're typically the building administrator, and they may help in the investigative process. Okay. So, um, Mr. Trafone put together uh, the current sports by season so that that's there for your review. We were able to take a look at the definition of cheerleading. That came into question at the Board of Ed meeting. And, um, you know, when we started to unfold and dive into that a bit, we uh, looked at the criteria uh, with fall being um, something that really doesn't fit that criteria, but spring and winter being competitive cheer season, fitting that criteria. So that was a factor that we did find. So this slide takes a look at that five-year trend that I was referring to. So you'll see the enrollment rate by males and females, and then the participation rate um, by males and females so that you can see what those trends look like over the past five years. In 1819, there was a dip, okay, where um, we had more males participating than females, and that's something that certainly we would wanna keep an eye on and see if that trend is continuing, and if it is, then we need to really kind of consider um, through OCR compliancy what we can do to reverse that trend and try to even that proportionate rate. So what we learned uh, is that we didn't violate Title IX due to the percentage rate with that natural fluctuation. Um, in, the, in the past, as I said, the past five years, we've had years where our females exceeded our male participation. Um, I think it's gonna be important to take a look, as I just said, about that fluctuation trend um, if it is something that we see and it continues to be um, looking like, uh, you know, there's more of 
a range of male to female, then we would want to take a look at how we would increase the participation rate of the non-represented group, um, whether that be male or female. I mean, this goes for, for both parties. Um, we are going to um, do that if we need to. Uh, there are no other sports in waiting that are in question. We do want to, we were, we were very careful to really listen to the students that spoke the other night at the Board of Ed when we interviewed them and to really listen to their concerns. So we do want to try to do more to address their concerns through, um, you know, more inclusion for the Blades as a recognized team. Um, and what that could look like is uh, assuring that they're in the yearbook, assuring that their events are publicized, um, that their scores are reported, that they can participate in um, captain's meetings and the other things that, that our sports teams do have access to. Um, we're also going to make the recommendation that the board um, approve uh, for the you know, next year's budget uh, funding that can be applied to help them participate and level that participation rate that they talked about when um, they were here on the 9th presenting to you. Uh, questions? Um, just to clarify, um, Title IX only relates to sports that are, no, so if there are other uh, extracurricular clubs, they could technically, uh, well, no, yeah, that's, they would, they would also be able to sort of come forward and say, it, it doesn't have to just be sports teams that would well, necessarily. Correct. Um, it certainly forward. applies to athletics. Um, we hear about it a lot in the news through intercollegiate. Um, you know, it's, it's something that's a little bit more pronounced and defined at the college level. Um, but uh, OCR uh, stands on a platform of equal accessibility for um, everything and taking, everyth taking that into consideration. So they look at discrimination based on a number of things. It could be... Um, you know, gender, it could be race, it could, it could be um, sexual orientation. Um, so very often when somebody has a claim of discrimination, as um, a, Title IX, a Title IX investigation would, would look at those types of factors too. Um, and once in a while we do, we do have those investigations and outcomes usually yield plans um, that can try to accommodate and support people that feel violated um, but also, uh, you know, trying to make sure that uh, concerns are addressed and shared appropriately and um, people are informed. Uh, so, you know, it, it does, it does uh, you know, yield some work over the course of the year in, in that investigative process. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the... Uh, Firstly, uh, thank you to, uh, to you and to Mr. Trifone for putting together this uh, great presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the participation relative to enrollment chart, mm -hmm. um, where you, you said that three of the five years we are not in violation. Um, and I'm only seeing, if I'm reading it correctly, I'm only seeing one year where I, if I were just looking at it as, you know, totally, uh, you know, uneducated on the subject, um, where I would think that there was one year, 16, 17, where the percentage of female is over 50%. So is there a plus minus that you're allowed to, to compensate for when you're looking at the numbers, or how do you consider that? Well, uh, I don't think that it's an exact formula. Uh, they try to look at 50-50, um, but they, uh, at least the law as it's written talks about this natural fluctuation but doesn't, uh, at least from what I've researched, define a clear percentage. So I think the guidance that you um, receive from the Office of Civil Rights is there, that there can be a trend, or excuse me, a year 
where you may see a fluctuation. Um, but if you're looking at that over a three, four, or five year period, that there's other steps that the district would have to do to try to level that playing field. So they would want to, um, you know, think about uh, how they can evaluate their current offerings and expand. Um, they would want to think about how they can accommodate to allow more accessibility. Um, so we are dedicated to taking a look at the end of this year, 1920 numbers to see if they reflect the same pattern as 1819. And if they do, then that's something that we do need to plan for accordingly. Okay, so then, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, so then from um, uh, 14, 15 through 16, 17, the trend is up, it's trending upward, so then that's good. But now that we're sort of, looks like trending, well, downwards, then mm -hmm. that, then we're, we're, it could be uh, in a position where we may need to take action. Correct. That's what you're saying. And, and, and as I said, um, you know, we had a, a few years where we had more female participation. Same for male. If we see a trend that's, you know, uh, looking disproportionate for our male population, we would want to do that same process. Okay? Um, if I may. Um, and then, uh, uh, Finally, um, when your recommendation for the for the blades um, was that to make them a team or to um, recommend additional funding to help them continue to be a more um, um, functional. I guess, I guess not functional is not the right word. No, um, to allow their participation to be more active as a co-op. Yes. So um, currently. Uh, CIAC does not consider um, girls ice, ice hockey as a sport because there's not enough common interest across the state. So many districts do co-op um, for their girls ice hockey teams uh, and it's not the Blades um, request to separate from the co-op. They want to remain with the co-op um, and we, we just don't have a level of interest to sustain a team ourselves. Um, so they would like to continue, but we would like to try to level that, that for them financially so that it is uh, less of a burden. Um, and then as I said, the other factors were the inequalities that they see about um, how they're looked at as far as their level of athletic um, participation in the school building. And those were all things, um, Dr. Gad and Mr. Trafone, um, you know, they, they were looking at this prior to that claim being made. They had made the request that um, this be something that's considered because, you know, uh, they want to support it. Um, and I think the, the factors of some of the things that they raised about, you know, um, the, the accessibility, the publicity, those were, were, when we think about them, small things, but to these kids make a big difference. And those are certainly factors that we want to put in place for them too. A couple questions, Tracy. Thank you again to the staff for pulling this together in, in short order. So there's a recommendation to the budget committee and the board ultimately to add about $6,600 to the budget. So I have a question. So would the goal be that the girls ice hockey would pay the same participation fee as the other groups, which is 225, if I'm not mistaken? For the hockey team, yeah, 225. 25. So yes, and the recommendation would be that they would uh, pay the pay to participate rate. Um, and then this additional money would offset. <laughs> um, the reason that it's recommended at 6,200 is um, Mr. Trafone uh, offered a, um, basically an average of participation rate over the past five or six years, and the average has been four athletes, so hence the 6,200. It makes sense. I assumed it was because of the six. So, so let's say, as i hopeful this will be the case, but if, if this is done, it, you know, it might uh, have more girls interested in the, in the sport, so what happens if next year uh, 10 girls show up? Where, where's the extra cost or funding to cover that cost going to come from? 
I think that um, it's always something uh, that's going to look at being reevaluated. So if that is a trend that we start to see, then that reevaluation process with the level of funding would need to be considered. Understood, but the budget will be set before we'll know that. So if there's a if there's a sixty two hundred dollar line item in the budget, hopefully there will be, and we have a good turnout, and you know are we comfortable that the budget can absorb, but someone's got to pay for those fees, or is it a case where the cost gets spread out to the participants, or or they're just going to pay the participation fee? I'm not clear on. Is that all they're going to pay if this is done, or how does that work? Well, I think if, um, I mean, currently they have four interested for next uh, season. Um, in the event that there were less um, than any additional money um, beyond their pay to participate would get brought back into the budget. Um, in the event that there are more um, athletes that come into, uh, you know, into this having an interest, uh, then I think it needs to be a consideration um, that the superintendent would would make and 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 have with uh, the administration at the high school, and of course with the board. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. No, for I, my point is, you know, it, I, I, hopefully it's not dozens more. If it's dozens more, that's, that's a great problem to have. Mm -hmm. Knowing, you know, we're going through the budget, I, I would have no problem supporting this, but. My gut tells me that this opens the door potentially for more folks to participate, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. We'll just be ready to plan for that if it happens. So mm -hmm. thank you for clarifying that. I, I guess I have a question. So <coughs> if I understand correctly, um, the, 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 the request that came in from the various schools to, to this process, did it originally have requests for funding for girls ice hockey, but then it was removed from the superintendent's final budget? I think he mentioned that in his presentation. It was um, on the original request that yeah. came in from the building administrators. They yeah. send in their, their um, requests building-wise um, in the middle of October, I believe. Yeah, it's usually early in the fall. So I, I guess my question is what changed to go from not well, including it to include it. Was it because of the, the group showing up and we, as I imagine, we have this information readily available every year. And it doesn't sound like this is driving necessarily the, the, the decrease in female participation is driving a decision for $6,200. It sounds like it's more because it is a co-op. You know, it's a club sport. It's co-op. It's done with other groups, semi-competitive. It's a, it's a high cost. So it sounds like we want to do the right thing mm -hmm. and make that fairly equitable for, for everyone, not because we did this study and realized that, oh, we should add this as a sport to offset any drop in enrollment. I just, I, it sounds like because they showed up, we did some further analysis, and it sounds like to me what they're asking for is, is fair. And that's how we came to this conclusion. Yes, I would agree with you. Uh, I think that after interviewing each child, talking to them about their concerns, you know, they bring to light some things that sometimes when it's out of sight, out of mind, we don't consider. Um, and as I did say, Mr. Trafone and Dr. Gad have uh, been looking at this for a while um, and have reported, you know, over the years that there's sustained interest. And that's another factor uh, when there's that sustained interest over a period of time, um, you know, we would want to take a look to um, see how can we accommodate, how can we make this better. I just want to, one last, just a general comment. I've, I've heard you know, on the forums, people seem to be so happy, like, you know, we're being threatened. I hear the word complaint used. I just want to clarify that the folks that showed up at our business meeting in no way, shape, or form came across as threatening a lawsuit or complaining or final th They were extremely professional, well-versed. They laid out a professional argument. So they've been nothing but, as far as I'm concerned, cordial and in the most positive light trying to work with the, with the school district. So. I don't think it was necessarily a complaint. I think folks were thinking there could be a Title IX issue. It doesn't sound like there is. But I just want to acknowledge that from what I've been hearing and seeing, they've been great to work with. And Absolutely. So uh, I think it's a very positive experience. I hope there's a positive outcome of this. Um, so that being said, one last thought. Since I know there's been kind of a rule over the years that as far as co-op, club, sport, as far as club sports are concerned, that we never really fund them as a board of ed because they need to be self-funded. 
I think unfortunately the girls ice hockey, hockey fall underneath that. Uh, and that's why, you know, ice, hockey costs a lot more, obviously. Mm -hmm. So on the surface, it seemed like they're being discriminated against, but that's not the case, not because they're females, just because of that club rule. Mm -hmm. um, the question I have is, if the board decides to do this, add this to the budget, what about the other clubs that may have come forward or will come forward that ask for funding? You know, I don't know, like I said, there's none of the sport waiting in the wings, but mm -hmm. does this open up discussions with potential other clubs to well, say, hey, you funded them, yeah. why don't you fund us? I think that ev everything is on an individual case, and it, uh, if anything like that does happen, um, you, we would be uh, required to refer back to those guiding questions about whether this is a sport or not. Um, and I mean, some of those factors, when we look at clubs, you know, if they uh, meet on an organized basis, um, that's one thing. But it really has to fall under, you know, is there a certified coach um, certified by the state? Um, do they have a designated schedule of practice time that's commensurate with other towns and districts that have a similar sport or club? Um, do they have an organized competition that they train for? Um, so when we were, when we were, you know, looking at some of that data, um, you know, currently people that fall or the groups that fall under those types of categories um, are currently being supported through the athletic department. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Thank you for uh, putting my questions. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah, this is, I don't think this is a really big deal to me, but just because this is part of the record, I don't know if this goes up online or anything, but I, I'm just, if you look at the percent male enrollment, just go to the bottom number down there, go to the percent female enrollment, 54 plus 46 would be 100, so that's over 100%, which is, I don't think, I don't, as I'm eyeballing this, it's not that big of a deal, but just in terms of having that like out in the public forum, like okay. if it gets put up on the website, okay. the, the trend appears to be exactly what you said, but mm -hmm. I'm just pointing out that mm -hmm. the so we percentages don't, yeah. Okay, yes, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and then a second question that I'm wondering about that I'm just trying to understand. You, uh, I think if you go forward, two slides. Yeah, CHS athletics funding. Which one? Oh, one more slide. Oh. Sorry, two slides. Um, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't present on this, and I have the feeling that... That one, that's what I was just talking about. Okay, I, I think that uh, Mr. Trafone will okay, be okay. taking over gotcha. for me okay. at this point. <laughs> Does anybody have any further questions for me? No. no. Actually, I do have one more. Um, right now, CIAC does not recognize it as a sport. Um, uh, two curiosities. Are they examining it? Because clearly we're hearing more about women's hockey. Mm -hmm. Are they, which would solve an awful lot of problems if they would mm -hmm. just say we recognize it as a sport. Um, did you get any feedback from them? And secondly, what are other schools who have co-op teams doing in terms of funding? Because okay. I assume we're not the only one. I think that CIAC is always going to be examining the level of participation in the growing, if there's a growing interest in what uh, they would determine. Um, I think that the only reason it's not considered a sport at this point is because of um, the current uh, percentage across the state of athletes that are participating, okay? Um, as far as the question about um, the other second schools. question, other, other schools. schools, so it's varied. Um, there are schools that will support teams 100% with athletic department funding. There are others who um, will provide a percentage like we're proposing, and there are some that are fully um, supported and funded by parents or fundraising efforts. So it fluctuates. Okay. I was going to add is so even within the co-op that the 
Cheshire High School girls participate, Amity does fund um, from their budget the girls' hockey participation, correct, Steve? And then North Haven, do they fully fund, partially fund, do you know? So North Haven, so, so the, the athletes pay for their uh, children's participation. Okay, so this is continuing on with the um, Cheshire High School athletics funding. So the, um, and I'm gonna ask Steve Trifone, our athletic director, to come and, and assist me with, with this uh, piece of the presentation. So um, as we said earlier, the Cheshire Public Schools is the primary funding source for all sports and extracurricular activities. Um, and what we're gonna show you is a series of slides by season and by sport, so you could see costs, revenues that come in, as well as what the cost is per participant. So I just want to tee that up a little bit for you. So the funding that we are showing you in the next slides includes coaches' salaries, transportation, you know, any athletic type supply, the cost of officials, um, as well as site rental, which we talked about, whether it's a hockey rink, or you know it's uh, Mount Southington, or the town pool. Um, the revenue that's generated, that's included in the upcoming slides, you know, is basically from ticket sales in some sports, um, and also participation fees. Uh, I, last year we shared this information. We collected about 163,000 in participation fees, you know, across Dodd and Cheshire High School. So those fees do offset some of the costs of the athletics. So just the athletic um, budget or the athletic costs at the high school, as you see, were $719,000 in 2018-19, and that includes fall cheer, which is 6,069.30. And correct me if I'm wrong, fall cheer is club. It's not considered a sport. It's a spirit group. So that is, I think the point there is that is supported, you know, by the uh, board's budget. And total revenues collected were 184,000. So that's participation fees plus the cost of admission to certain events. Sure. Uh, I don't think we've covered this really in any detail in prior years since I've been on the board, but since the girls ice hockey question came up in funding, a lot of board members are getting questions on, you know, why, why can't the board pay for this? It's only a drop in the bucket, uh, in overall scheme of a $76 million budget. And I think what people don't realize is the board doesn't pay full for all sports. There's additional costs that our budget don't cover. And I think there's outside groups uh, and folks that donate money to cover those costs. So while it's, while it's a $225 participation fee, uh, it doesn't mean that all those costs are covered, and uh, it kind of caught the board off guard a little bit because we really don't have any detail beyond what's in the budget, what other money is coming in necessarily to cover these costs. So we get a true sense of what things cost. We thought it was worthwhile in the spirit of this Title IX discussion to go into details. I appreciate you coming down tonight, Steve, and helping us walk through that. You're good? Okay. So uh, the first season that we're gonna talk about is fall. So you could see um, up at the top, the football expenditure is about 79, well, it's about $80,000. Uh, but you have revenue coming in of about 26,914. Uh, and I'm not gonna read all of them, just the bigger ones, girls swim, dive, 37,000 expenditure, about $7,200 in revenue. Uh, girls soccer, 25,000. So you can see the ones that are above the 25,000 mark and cross country for boys and girls um, is at the lower end for fall sports at about 13,000. Again, all in, transportation, cost of any officials and related expenses. Um, so I think the interesting thing is when you look at it on a per player cost, um, you could see that football fields the largest team with 78 players. The average cost per player all in is $680.30. Again, that's net, so 
Steve would subtracting the revenue <clears throat> from the expenses to get that net cost number, right. correct? Right. Uh, so the range there is, looks like boys soccer at 250-185, again, a relatively large team, 61 uh, participants in that sport. Um, and then on the upper end, you know, it is football, followed by girls volleyball and girls swim dive. So uh, as we go through each sport, we could pause if there's any questions or we could keep moving on. Okay. And this is, this is fluid also as numbers change throughout the years. Uh, some years we could have more football players, therefore the cost per player goes down. Uh, other years, you know, less players, et cetera, cost goes up. So, but it's about an average. Go ahead. Uh, if you don't mind. So the cost per player, uh, again, it's probably a dumb question, but obviously uh, transportation, does that include transportation, yes. coaching stipends, the insurance that we pay out, you know, out of the, uh, that we budget in the line item? It doesn't include the student accident insurance. Okay. Okay, so, but I, all the other, you know, we'll call them incremental costs that occur at the high school. It does include all those. Trainer costs, um, referees. Uh, Correct. Right, right. So officials cost, transportation, uh, the, the um, stipends for uh, coaches and their equipment cost a as well. That's what uh, gets lumped into that eventually cost per, pl per player related like we have to clean uniforms we have to have helmets um, so, periodically so checked those types of things are included if I if I'm mistaken don't we have some groups that uh, would buy uniforms or helmets or soccer jerseys from time to time so how does that get factored into the cost is the was what's in the what's in the budget is a, a, a next number for sports costs but then that wouldn't include for example Two thousand dollars for helmets, right? Does that? If so, if they are donated by Gridiron or Booster Club, those funds don't flow through our budget, so that would be over and above these costs that you see here. These are really the so board-related costs board after money. revenues. Correct. We'll be able to see the actual true cost with those things passing through, so we have a good idea what it actually costs. Because that's that's kind of what I was asking for. You're you're talking about uh, with cost per player with uh, parent groups putting yeah, money like, in as well? Yeah, if you don't have it tonight, that's okay, but if you go back a slide where you had uh, the total by sport. So, I mean, football's number one, let's pick on that. So is it really $79,000 or is it really $89,000 with the stuff coming through that's donated or uh, just kind of curious what the true cost is? I'm sorry, Tim. If you don't have it tonight, it's fine. It's kind of no, no, correct. So um, the the monies that we're showing up here are board of ed funding. So uh, other items above and beyond that would be up there uh, coming from parent groups isn't listed on that. And again, that's another come and go as it is. The expenses that we we spend on our sports outfit our teams. Uh, we make sure every kid, for example football. We make sure every kid has a helmet. What some of our outside organizations will do is give us money to buy brand new helmets. Uh, so, uh, right, that money could go up. Uh, an example would be there's an alumni association. Uh, that's a, another organization out there that is uh, put together by a group of, of past football players. They purchased new helmets for the team, probably at a cost of about $10,000. So gives our team, puts us in the best helmets that are out there. The ones we had were perfectly fine, but this just kind of gave us a, an added bonus. And that's not shown in that number, mm -hmm. right? Could we get that number, Steve? We could, yeah. I, I, I could get those numbers. Uh, I can get numbers for you of what parent groups pay for, for our, our teams. Yeah, I think we... Uh, and again, I'm not sure how the groups are, you know, with transparency. I, I don't, I don't think we need to see the name of the group and what they contributed. But it, again, if I'm, if finance committee thinks I'm off the mark, I, I think we understate as a, as a district what it costs, and I think it does uh, a little bit more of an eye opener to see the real cost 
And the fact that there are these groups that help the kids greatly, uh, I think that should be there at some point. But, yeah, but anyway, nonetheless, got it. The answer is good, but carry on. Thanks, Steve. To add a little bit of clarity, my thought on this, I am curious about in-kind contributions. When I ran cross-country, we did pasta suppers. I'm not interested in any sort of parental, parental contributions like that. But like you said, $10,000 for football helmets. So I'm just curious, everything over you know, $500 as an example of type of thing, not all the other stuff. It would take forever and be incredibly difficult or impossible to quantify. But if you know that something costs, say, over $500, then just jot it down on a piece of paper, and this is a sort of a cost that's not borne by the taxpayers. Right. So we're looking at more uh, equipment items, not, uh, like you said, banquets and things of that nature. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, so, a bank, so I'm not sure if you, there's like a, a banquet where you rent out the aqua turf. So that, that, I mean, something like that would be, I have no idea, that would be of interest. I was, literally, I was talking about Ron McCreevy used to, like, find a parent, we'd go to the house, have pasta. There's, yeah. there's no definition to it. And I don't know what you would, what you would be able to quantify, because it's not your, it's not running through the public schools, through the, through the Department of Education, but what you know or, or can sort of get an idea about. Some of the sports banquets are bigger than our proms, so, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's, there's monies out there for that as well um, so the uh, the additional the additional revenue that is not reported here I would assume comes through the student activity accounts no not not really they're, not they're private organizations uh, well yes and no they are at, at the school they have accounts at the school we don't include them into the student activity fund if I'm not mistaken so it's a, basically there, such as an example would be uh, boys soccer would have a boys soccer account at the high school. That does not get included into our student activity fund on an annual basis. So does each team have a student activity fund or does the, each school have a student activity fund? Because uh, like when you're saying that the, um, uh, the alumni association makes a, per a large purchase like that, do they make the purchase on their own and donate the equipment to the school or uh, how would that normally work correct or right exactly right so they will either one of two things either happen one they donate the money to us and then the athletic department will purchase it or two they go out and they purchase the item donate the actual material to us but either way it becomes board of ec property okay so in the instance where money is donated where does the money end up it ends, it's basically in, in an out fund. Uh, it's a, we'll get an invoice for an item that they want. Uh, the example would be, let's say they wanted to purchase 25 helmets. We get a price of 25 helmets. Okay, it's gonna cost this much. They will give me a check for that amount. We just turn it over and pay for, for the helmets. So we being? We, the athletic department. So, uh, sorry, so through Cheshire High School, or it's like, is, it a, is there a, a bank account or I mean, I'm trying to understand how the how the money would would flow it, through exactly I may, it'll flow through the student activity account for Cheshire High School okay. so what Steve is saying it and I know we talked about student activity but student activity are not board owned funds right they sit in a separate account they're not in the general fund of the of the town are they in the, are they in the $75 million budget no absolutely not so student activity, and each school has a student activity account, so the money would come into the student activity sub-account for, I'm making it up football because I don't know if they have one, and then the money would be paid out of that student activity account. So student activity are not our funds. So in order to, I'm just trying to get a hand on, on true cost. Um, so there are other accounts not part of the Board of Ed that exist that assist with the cost of sports teams. Well, what Steve's saying is <laughs> not all of it goes through student activity. Sometimes an organization like Booster Club will make a purchase directly. So it doesn't come through the student activity account so, at the high school. So do we have um, any procurement regulations dictating how a vendor could be chosen to spend the money or does the group choose the vendor or 
or, or how does how does that work? Is is there a, a purchase order created somewhere, or you know how, how are how would the funds be tracked exactly? The funds are tracked through each organization's account at the high school, uh, so we have records of all those money in, money coming out. Uh, it's really up to the organization. So if they came to me and said that we would like to purchase something for the soccer team, uh, here is the item. Uh, I'll either go with the vendor that they had chosen, or sometimes what I'll do is I say, hey, look, I know another vendor. I can get the exact same thing at a cheaper price. Uh, we'll go ahead with, with that vendor. But either way, the, um, there is accounting for it in each ac account at the school for those organizations. And um, are the, uh, the vendors that um, you would potentially recommend, do we have like an approved vendor list? We do, right. Yeah. It would have to be an approved vendor. We can continue, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand this. It's, you, Vin, I thought you said a minute ago, it's, it's not our funds or something like that. Student act, the student activity. Yeah. It's not Board of Ed funds. Those are separate accounts held for the benefit of students. Sure, no, and I understand right? that. So like a, a, an example at an elementary school would be, you know, funding raised for a class trip. You know, that goes into the student activity account and then funds that need to be used to be paid for the benefit of the student flow through that account. Now, student activity funds are reported, you know, as a, a fiduciary account. If you look at the town's financials, they're, they're considered a fiduciary account. But again, the, I just want to make a distinction. They're not Board of Ed funds. They're not budgeted. It's not included in what we present as part of the budget. You're looking at me. There's a question there, Tim. So, yeah, no, no yeah. I'm just, I, honestly, I just, I'm just kind of dumbfounded by it because I feel like, so I go to a worst case scenario, something happens and I feel like I have my kind of am in charge of it, but not really. But if something bad happens, the finger gets pointed at the Board of Ed, and that's why I'm totally confused about this. Okay. And I get it. I mean, because there's situations where, like, the PTAs, okay, they pay for something. It's done entirely sort of on their own. But I, I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Uh, with our operating budget, you know, so if the if the board overspends its budget, right, it's it's personally liable. Yeah, but, yeah. But not these, the these but, activity. These, but these are not. Uh, I know I know this is a weird legislation in, in Connecticut, it, but these are not board of accounts. I mean, I can't imagine they overspend it. In a worst case scenario, there's a, a you know a negative balance in the account because someone's tracking what happens then, kind of thing. Yeah. The board's not. I, well, I don't know. Is that a good answer? I though? guess. I guess it's Vincent's problem. <laughs> it kind of is. So, board, the student activity accounts. We could do another whole presentation on that. It's student activity accounts, you know, are established under Connecticut general statutes. You know, so they're they're used by all school districts for the purpose of, you know, collecting money and spending money for student-related activities. Just kind of as the name sounds. Um, they are audited annually. You know, just to make sure that the accounts are being reconciled, they're audited by RSM, our outside auditors. So there are controls in place. You know, the checks that are issued from student activity accounts, you know, the principals are here. They're all, you know, two-party checks. So there is that dual control over the assets. Um, but again, not budgeted, not part of the Board of Ed's operating budget. Your question about, you know, if something happens, is the board responsible, I'm not a lawyer, I don't want to answer that question, but I could certainly find that out. I don't think so. You're responsible as a board member for the board's operating expenses. Um, so who's responsible for doing the consolidated reporting? Because, uh, you know, I looked on the uh, consolidated financial report for it looks like 17, 18, it looks like that was the last one. Uh, and there's a huge amount of money flowing through those accounts. Uh, well over a million dollars, um, and so who's does? So every team has a student activity account that flows up into a main account, and then that's reported to the town. Each school has its own student activity account uh -huh. and accounts for it, and then it's reported under fiduciary funds, you know, at the town level, 
based on each school. Balance. So does the, like so it the, doesn't roll up into one master account. Does the drama club treasurer have to make a report to the town? Drama club. Well, it, 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 by definition, it says the student activity uh, is for student act, is for student activity. So if the drama club has an account where they had a fundraiser, and let's say you know they raised ten thousand dollars, it says that there's a treasurer that's supposed to be responsible for the funds. And so, like I said, there's a, a line item in the town budget that says X, uh, there was a beginning, uh, beginning balance, X amount of money, millions of dollars flows through, this is expended, comes in and is an expended. So who reports the, those numbers to the town from the school system? I'm just confused on the drama club question. Well, we no, we well, report the balance well, of if, each student activity account at each school. You know, so we report that. Okay. Yeah. We being we the school district reports the balance. So the of school district is responsible for the reporting, but we are not responsible the for the money. No. Time out. <laughs> Student activity con accounts are managed at each of the respective schools. Yeah. Right. There's a person that's responsible for accepting funds, writing checks, reconciling the account. We, at central office are responsible to make sure that those accounts are being reconciled. As I said, they're audited every year as part of the audit, even though they're not Board of Ed funds, and the balance of those funds are added up, and they are shown as a fiduciary account balance. Um, so, I'm, so someone in central office, which I guess would be under your supervision, yes. does the does the accounting for those accounts, no. or no? No, we does just, the, the accounting is done at the school uh -huh. and reported. And then they report to you. Correct. And then you consolidate and report to the town. We take the total of each and report that to right. the town. So there's, so there's a beginning balance, an ending balance at the end of every fiscal year, and that's what's you know reported to the town and winds up in that so line called fiduciary account. So you're just like, okay, thanks account. for your numbers, now we'll just report that and then so is it the administrator of the school who's ultimately responsible for all of the money that flows through the individual accounts? Who's at each, responsible? At their school, sure. So if there's like a half a million dollars that flows through uh, at a school, mm -hmm. then the administrator of that school is responsible for that money. Well, with whoever's doing the, the actual accounting for that, like at the high school, that's the only school that would have a half a million dollars in a balance, followed by Dodd, you know, followed by Highland. So, um, again, it's dual control, you know, it is reconciled, it is reported, it is audited. I know that there's, I see concern, yeah. but this is not something new. We've been managing student activity accounts in our school district for, you know, decades. Yeah, can I, could you send me a copy of the auditor's report? I asked for a specific reason because 15 years ago I was on the town council mm -hmm. and I had assumed that the audited financial statements for the Board of Ed, which were incorporated in the town's audit, I had assumed that the budget that was audited would have been approved by the Board of Ed. That's the way it's supposed to work. It is the way it works. It wasn't. And I spoke to our auditor about it and he told me flat out, he said, we followed the law, we did what we were, and this has nothing to do with you. This is long before you were ever there, but I'm just pointing out, I don't have a great, you use the word audit, and you use it appropriately as far as I'm concerned, but I just don't have the confidence in it really. Because literally what it was, when I, when I started asking the questions, it never, it was never, the, the budget that was audited was never actually approved by the Board of Ed. It was what the superintendent gave to the town. And when I asked the auditors, they said, we did what we were supposed to do. So I just don't have confidence, and that has nothing to do with you at all. But I'm just hoping okay. to see the auditor's report because I don't really have confidence uh, that it is a standard audit that is sort of how you know, regular people would understand it. Okay, just to be clear, so you know, when we say it's audited, and, and the audit report for, for the 
18, 19 fiscal year, I think is actually being reported to the town council next week or the following week. So we'll have, you know, the updated audit report relatively soon. Um, but it's, you know, the typical function of an audit, you know, does include a test for controls, you know, test to make sure there's things like dual control. You know, they do, um, as part of every year's audit, pull one or two of the school's student activity accounts and they review the transactions there. You know, so it, they're not looking at every line and every detail in any audit, but it's all the, it's all the controls and the statistical testing that they do. Um, you know, they'll, you know, on, on a typical audit, they'll pull a list of, you know, accounts and checks that were issued and make sure that there's appropriate documentation. So, you know, does an audit guarantee you know, 100% accuracy? No, but, you know, it's designed to find, you know, if there is an issue, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's just that my experience 15 years ago was all that could be said, but it literally just sort of flew in the face of conventional wisdom. Okay. Well, when the audit report comes out, you know, I'll certainly share it with the board. So we're good with fall? Yeah. On to winter. These are the winter sports. Um, there's boys ice hockey. You could see 68,000 expended, 14,000 in revenue. Um, and then boys girls basketball, 33,000 and, and 33,000. And you could see the corresponding revenue. And the ne next largest one is boys swim diving with 39,000 expended and revenues of about 6,000. If you look at this on a cost per player, like we did with the fall sports, um, you could see the biggest, you know, teams are boys and girls indoor track with 48 and 66 students. So you could see, you know, the cost there. On the high side, it looks like boys swim diving <laughs> is the highest from a cost per player perspective. Oh, wrestling. And boys ice hockey, I apologize. Hockey, that's uh, not including their activity fee. Is that correct, or is that including? No, that their would activity? include the revenue offset. Oh, okay. Yeah. And again, the fee is that it's two hundred twenty-five dollars. Correct, Steve, for ice hockey. Right. But, I mean, the one thing that we know about ice hockey is that it's the rink time that you know is a big factor. And I don't know, I mean, transportation-wise, how far does boys ice hockey travel? We travel to uh, Wesleyan University. That's our home rink and our practice rink okay. to and from. Good. Spring sports. Um, baseball, softball, 34,000, 24,000. You could see the corresponding revenue. Uh, lacrosse in the $25,000 plus range with revenues offsetting that of about 8500 And then if you look at it, cost per player, you know, it looks like boys, girls, golf, and baseball, softball have the highest cost per player for spring. Boys and girls golf is due to the rent, rental of the. Uh, Do they both play in Southington? The boys play at the farms and the girls play at Southington. Okay. But we're starting to veer more to both boys and girls at Southington. Okay. Questions? Because this rounds out the sports season. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, you broke it as detail. It does, you know, give me a better appreciation for, you know, I hope for the town, you know, that watches this or goes back to information that, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of cost to everything. You know, costs always go up. Um, I didn't realize it was that high for some cases, but it gives me a new perspective on things. But I appreciate you putting this together. Okay. 
Well, we'll try and get the additional information. Yeah, when we, we get we to can it, I just... rework the numbers and share that with the board. And we'll try. I'm not sure if we can have it for Thursday night's meeting, but sounds like we may go on past Thursday night. So as soon as we have it, we'll share it with the board members. What I'll do is I'll take a look at the 1819 expenditures from our parent groups, and uh, as mentioned, any item that maybe $500 or more of equipment item, I can list down of what, the, what was a donation to us. Okay, just two more um, pieces of information we wanted to share, and that is uh, the parent group impact. So Steve, I'll let you explain this. And well, we, we operate um, with two uh, booster club groups, if you want to call them. One is an individual parent group, which really only serves their team, and the other one is a general Cheshire High Booster Club. So we broke these down as to what they do. Uh, again, it's benefits to the team beyond what is budgeted, just to kind of give our, ki our kids uh, a little better athletic experience a lot of times. Some of the things that these parent groups do is they'll offer food on away trips, sandwiches, and et cetera. Most of our teams are now playing night games, so uh, it tends to be uh, dinner for them. Uh, they do help out with uniform replacement at more regular increments where we can purchase uniforms instead of giving them a lifespan of five or six years, we're turning them over at three or four years because the parent groups are helping us purchase uniforms at a, at a faster rate. Uh, some of our teams will uh, pay for an additional coach. That money is funded through the Board of Ed. Uh, they pay for all of the expenses that we require for, for a coach, including the insurance and, and any FICA. Uh, we offer, most of our teams also do a video service where they will videotape the, the games. Then our athletes can go back and uh, they can actually cut tapes of their play time. Uh, they make highlight tapes, etc. Most of our teams now do it. It's an expensive service, but uh, just about every school in Connecticut has invested in that and our parent groups do that as well. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, the end of the year student banquets, they'll pay for that, uh, senior gifts, things of that nature. So the, again, in, in essence, uh, they just help uh, with the athletic experience, make it a little more, more special, adding some things to the teams. The, the second one is the Cheshire High School Booster Club. This club oversees all sports and not an individual sport. Uh, it's been around for quite a few years. Uh, they're very active in it. So some of the things that, that they do is uh, they will aw purchase awards for teams at banquets. Uh, they do offer team grants. So a team would apply to them and say, hey, we're looking for this piece of equipment. Here's the reason why. It's not in my budget or our budget, but it's something that we could use. If the Booster Club approves it, then they'll go ahead and purchase it. Uh, any of our championship banners or any of the banner updates, that's all paid for by our Booster Club. We do concussion test all of our athletes, so every athlete gets what is called the impact concussion test. It allows us as another tool to, for our trainer to test kids. If they were, did have a concussion, uh, we can monitor their recovery. So our Booster Club pays for that software. It's about a cost of $800 a year. Uh, for us to test all of our kids. They do offer scholarships. Students will apply for that. Uh, they offer, I believe, about eight scholarships per year. Uh, example would be last year I brought in a guest speaker to talk to parents about uh, the recruiting uh, aspect of coming from high school to college. Uh, and That person came in and a answered a lot of questions for us. Example would be Booster Club paid for that guest speaker to come in. And then they also print seasonal sport uh, schedules that we distribute to whomever wants to. So just some examples of what our overall Booster Club does. Their uh, funding comes from concession stands and also memberships uh, from parents. It's $20 uh, per family for that. It's totally voluntary for parents to pay. And that's where their funding comes from. Any, any questions? Yes, um, you mentioned that the funding comes from the concession stands. Right. So I'm just curious, so I'm assuming this is something that's gone on for decades. They've staffed the concession stands. 
Is that, are they the only ones who do it? Does anybody else do it? Uh, the Booster Club is the only one that does the concession stand at most of our major events. Some of the smaller events, Tim, uh, some of the individual teams will run their own concession stand. Okay. Um, and then that, that is income for them. Okay. Uh, run by their parent group. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Anything else, folks? That's it for the athletic portion of tonight's discussion. Again, I thank you for your support with athletics. Uh, you know, we have a great athletic program, and I know you guys uh, support us well, so thank you. You know, your staffs are putting us together. We just felt, you know, with uh, the girls' ice hockey and, you know, having this detail hopefully sheds a little more light to the community that, you know, there's more involved to just what's in the board budget to support this stuff. So I appreciate it. Thank you for coming to this. Thank you. Okay, how about a little building use? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair of the Finance Committee, I'm wondering if we, can we switch up instructional expense before we get into the building use overview? I apologize if I'm screwing up your. Um, just curious. It, well, first of all, the building use thing isn't even on the agenda, and we're supposed to be going through the instructional expense and special education presentation, and not, not that I'm like, making any judgments, but I think that's a little bit more important than going into the building use overview, if that's possible, because I also have to leave at some point, and I'd like to. Um, well, it was uh, Mr. Massian explained to me that the building use is part of the operations and maintenance uh, portion of the presentation, so we okay. just felt that we could we'd do it earlier in the evening. Um, so that's sort of our the, the thought process there. Um, but um, in, the, in the interest of, of time, or not even time, that's the wrong word, but uh, how long do you think that the uh, instructional expense uh, presentation would uh, go? Just to... Uh, just instructional or yeah, the rest of tonight? The, no, just instructional. Um, and special education. 15 minutes. Well, special education, I... Yeah, um, that's... Yeah, special education, we were going to, at the end of this meeting, we were going to, to table that and, and push that for it till Thursday. Oh. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't care. It, okay, I thought... Yeah, so no, we're not okay. going to try and fit everything in tonight. We're going to, okay. uh, because of the, the additional information, we're going to, we're going to extend out. So, okay. um, all right, so why don't we, we'll continue on how we're going, since you're ready. Thank okay, you. so building use, I, I, I will cover this as quickly as I can, you know, so if there are questions, we could stop. But building use, um, I know that it's been a, a topic that's this been discussed, you know, lately in, um, you know, amongst the board members and also quite extensively last year. So I know we have some new board members, so I just want to kind of cover the basic. The first is building use policy and fees around building use, which consists of building use fees and custodial fees, are governed by Board of Ed policy number 1330. It's very detailed. There's a policy and there's a regulation, so I'm not going to cover, you know, the entire policy this evening, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware that there is a board policy that covers it. And that policy starts with that the school buildings and grounds are public property and the board may make them available for purposes other than education when they're not in use for school purposes. So what I thought I would do is just, you know, point out the obvious. You know, the first priority as it relates to building use is use by our buildings for our schools. You know, one of the things that we really are very, you know, cognizant and careful about is we have to get 180 student days in each year, and they have to be completed by June 30th. Um, and what affects our ability to meet June 30th are when we close a building. So we try never to close buildings, but to the extent we have to, um, the typical reason that we close our buildings is the board you know, and the community members know, is when there's weather, generally snow. So, you know, we don't have a choice. We're, we um, do try and, and 
do delayed openings or early dismissals if we can, but there are days that we have to close. The other reason that we close buildings, uh, which is less frequent, is when we have an emergency, such as a power loss in a building, lack of heat. Um, I put here black water backups, which happens from time to time. So, you know, there are those emergencies that prevent us from opening a building or requiring early dismissal. Um, the most important thing, you know, as it relates to building use, you know, regardless of whether it's for students or non-students, is safety, so security, and the needs of the building occupants. Those are the critical things that we have to manage. Uh, and also the protection of the buildings. There are school and town assets, so we work very hard to make sure that you know, we're preserving the actual asset. When we're in school, I just want the board members to kind of think about what you already know. We have a lot of resources on hand when we have occupants in the building. You know, we have our administrators, we have our nurses, we have our building maintainers, um, um, we have other maintenance staff, we have our school resource officers, hall monitors, and the list goes on and on. Obviously, our teachers are there, you know, our instructional assistants, I think those are given, but outside of those classroom resources, there's a lot of staff in the building when the buildings are occupied. The second priority for our building, um, and it's not that it's not important, but it is the second priority, is any after hour use, whether if it's for, you know, students, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, PTA, evening and weekend use. Our buildings are used constantly, um, especially as you look at the larger buildings being the high school, you know, Dodd, you know, Highland, but all our buildings are used quite a lot. Generally, we're going to have lower occupancy rates during the uh, after hours use. We're going to have less resources on hand, but that doesn't mean the safety and protection of the occupants and the protection of the assets aren't critical. So with that said, the, there's a policy around building use as to who pays building use fees. So this slide just talks about building use fees. If you are a group two user, there is a fee, and I'm going to show you that schedule in just a second. If you're a group one user, which includes Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, PTA, PTOs, um, park and rec, you don't pay a building use fee. Building use fee is intended to cover our overhead. Electricity, heat, cooling, maintenance, bathroom supplies, supplies related to cleaning. Okay, so there's a policy around that. It's, it's very, very detailed. The fees, if you're a group one, you see up at the top, if you're a group one user, there is no building use fee. Board of Ed, as an example, does not pay a building use fee when we have our, our Board of Ed meetings. But if you're in group two, three, or four, you could see this is just a schedule for the high school. Again, this is all available online in the Board of Ed policy section. Um, if you're using a gym at the high school and you're a group two, it's $120. If you're a group three, it's $300. Um, and if you're group Four, it's actually the 300 plus the 78, I believe is how that, that works. So just understand, there is a schedule for building use. We reported at the last, um, either the last board meeting or at, at Mr. Solon's presentation, that our building use fees collected were about $13,000 last year. The bulk of that, 9,000, is paid by the YMCA because they have the before and after care. Um, you know, I would say as a general statement, there's a lot of legacy users that fall and aren't charged a building use fee. They're treated as if they're group one, but they're not necessarily group one. A lot of those come through the park and rec program, even though they're not bona fide park and rec um, programs. So we haven't been, my point is we haven't been aggressive on collecting building use fees. I think it's a matter of of the way things were and just, just being good community citizens. We allow our building use. The second piece to, to fees is this. It's the custodial fees and it's the cafeteria fees. So um, if there's a custodian and, and we call our custodians building maintainers now, the rate that you pay is um, $50 an hour if it's evenings or it's Saturdays, 
because our staff gets paid time and a half, and the $50 covers basically their payroll cost. It's their salary, plus FICA, plus the variable portion of the pension contributions. We're not charging for medical benefits or anything like that. Um, that staff, if they're in the building, is paid $65 an hour on Sundays and holidays because they're on double time. And to the extent that um, any building user is using cafeteria staff, it's the same thing. It's the hourly rate plus related payroll cost. Both groups have a minimum of, of three hours, and then there's an additional fee over and above that. So I already talked about the overhead. What, what I want to spend a minute on is the custodial fees. So the custodial fees are intended to reimburse us for the payroll cost when we have to assign a building maintainer. We had over 9,300 events. If you look at um, our event calendar, um, about 200 of those events were events where we had to have a building maintainer and the custodial fee was charged. So the vast majority of the times, there is no custodial fee with building use. But the reasons that we need a building maintainer are um, whenever we have a, an event that has spectators, right? So if it's just a practice and a coach and students, generally there's not a building maintainer. But if we have spectators, if food is being served or is being consumed, we'll need a building maintainer. If school equipment is being used or if um, we have lifting or moving of items, have to have a building maintainer because we don't want anyone to get hurt. In that middle section there, you see that um, groups are not charged a custodial fee if we have a custodian in the building already. So that's typically Monday to Friday, you know, till about 3.30 in the elementary schools. Dodd, we have someone here till 6. And at Cheshire High School, Monday through Friday, we have a building maintainer in the building till um, 10 o'clock. So if there's already a, a building maintainer, and it's not an event that you know, we specifically need a maintainer because there's food being served, that is no charge to the user group. Uh, I already talked about the fees at the bottom here. So one of the things that we do allow, um, as an example here at, at Dodd, middle school is if there's a basketball practice, park and rec, Cheshire travel basketball, those are two separate groups, the um, park and rec department assigns what they call a building supervisor. And, and basically they'll allow people into the building, into the gym. Um, and, and we're perfectly okay with that. But the level of service that we provide and we need a building maintainer for is a lot different, and that's what I want to just take you through. It's not just opening and closing the building, and it's just, just not just cleaning up the building. You know, our building maintainers are very familiar with the buildings, with the building systems, whether it's a security system, you know, whether it's a lighting system, electrical system. They have access to all areas of the building. Um, they could troubleshoot issues in real time, which do occur. You know, they can identify corrective actions that need to be taken. You know, they have uniforms, they're readily identifiable, and they're duly trained for an occupied building, which is very, very important. You know, they participate in all the drills we have when there's, you know, staff and students in the building, so that's one of the, the traits that they have. You know, this is a little bit hard to read, and the board members do have this, but the type of training that our building maintainers have to go through, um, most of this is, is repeated annually, but I'm not going to go through all of them, but they are trained in first aid. They are mandated reporters under DCF, so if they observe an issue and a concern about a, a student, they are mandated reporters and, and are trained in how to do that. Obviously, some of the things that you would expect, back injury and lifting, uh, eye and face protection, those are things that they're trained for. The one on here that I think is important and is often um, maybe overlooked or, or not recognized is that, you know, kind of in the middle, bloodborne pathogen exposure prevention. Um, so, in the ordinary world of a parent, you know, if a child spits up or if there's, you know, a poop miss or something like that, 
you deal with it very differently than in a school. In a school, those are all blood-borne pathogens that have to be treated with you know, the proper equipment and the proper materials and chemicals, okay? So um, it's a big deal, and our staff is trained in that. And so what could possibly go wrong in our buildings? A lot. And I didn't list them all, but these are just some of the more recent ones at Highland. You know, we had a power outage, and we blew up 24 heating coils. We had to close just Highland School. Actually, we just hit the one-year anniversary of that. It was Martin Luther King Day last year. You know, because of the skills of our staff and our vendors, we only lost one school day, which we had to make up at the end of, of the year. But that's one thing that could go wrong. You know, we had over at Norton a tree fell on one of our portables. We had a gas leak over at Chapman School. Actually, this, this um, past school year um, at Cheshire High School in September of 2016, we had to have emergency early dismissal because you know there was a, a backup uh, from our toilets into the main hallway. And at Highland School, we had a um, carbon monoxide event that was you know, rather serious back in 2016. So there's a lot to our buildings and, and a lot of things that can happen when it's occupied. So that's why we're really, really diligent and careful. We don't, um, you know, on, certainly on the after hours side, we, you know, look to assign um, a building maintainer when we need it, when we think it's the safe and the prudent thing to do. Uh, we don't overuse it. I think we, we do it reasonably and responsibly. And then the last thing I want to leave you with is, you know, building use planning um, takes a lot of resources here at the schools. And, you know, the, there is an online application called FS Direct. That's how individuals request building use. I could present on a, a day on that system. But just understand, we had about 9,300 building events that we had to manage. We don't have any one person assigned to do building use. It's assigned to a bunch of different people. Whenever a building use request comes in for Dodd Middle School, for example, it's electronically routed through the secretary, the administrator, central office. You know, if it needs to get appealed, it would go to our um, either our facility manager or for me. We have to do the billing. We have to do the collection. So there's a lot of work and effort that goes into building use. Um, you could see that we estimated it's about 1,435 hours per year. So, um, you know, I think for the most part, I, it's fair to say that those b the building use that we have runs pretty smoothly and effectively. Um, and I think we do provide, you know, good value to the, to the users after the school day. That's building use. Thank you for that. Um, you had mentioned, I, I could, you had mentioned, I think you said you hadn't been ag aggressive in collecting the building mm -hmm. use fee. I'm curious, what is a, so what sort of system do you use for the building use fee? And specifically what I'm wondering about, so I do this myself in my own job. Yeah. I get, I'm involved in this. And, I mean, if you use Excel, an event could get deleted and then, you know, by accident, and then you have no idea it happened and the fee never gets collected. Is there any sort of audit trail over well, building? FS Direct is a, is a piece of software that's designed specifically for schools okay. for building use. Okay. So we were on paper system until three years ago. Okay. Um, and since we've been on FS Direct, you know, we're doing a lot better job of not only tracking events, but also billing and collecting. So when I say, you know, we haven't been aggressive at collecting fees, it's, it's not that. It's that we as a school in general haven't been very aggressive at charging people fees. I mean, if we stuck to the schedule, we would have additional building use revenue. That's certainly something that we can do. I'm not advocating for that, but 
you know, there's a lot of legacy users that, you know, we are in charge of building use. Custodial reimbursement, different. If we have a custodian, you know, we are charging and billing for that. So, okay, so this is catching me off guard. I saw the list before of the class one and it's PT, PTAs, PTOs, Boy Scouts, and they don't get charged, but then there's other groups. So honestly, I mean, the thing is, is that does, does somebody end up having the ability to steer things in a certain direction because it's their brother or something? I mean, it's a... No, no, it's, okay. not, it's not that. It's that we have people that fall into group two that aren't charged building use yep. because they are typically um, getting treated as if they were a park and rec organization, even though they're not. And these are basically legacy issues that, I yeah, mean, should the board of They're local groups, they're yeah, local yeah, yeah, community yeah. groups. No, 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 but it's like the Booster Club is the one who has been collecting, you know, doing the concession stands. I get it, it's been out there. I mean, is yeah. this something that the Board of Ed should be uh, reviewing to see how it should be enforced? It seems to me like it's... I think the intent is for the board to get a little bit deeper into the weeds, not necessarily tonight, but that sure. is, there is a lot more to this that we can talk about. Okay, thank you. Vincent, you mentioned earlier uh, 5,000 pretty staggering numbers. So 9,300 events, was that for the last school year, last that calendar was, year? That was 17-18 um, actually. Last year is, uh, I don't have final numbers pulled, but last year is about you know, the same amount. And that ranges for okay. everything. YMCA, you know, before and after care. You know, they're in the building in the morning. They're in the building in the evening. So for each school, that's you know 360 events times the um, six schools, I think, where they operate. So board of ed meetings. But then again, there's all the sports groups, all the gym use. I know we've been hearing a lot about gym use, but those yeah, 9,300 no, I, I, events I, uh, include all that. No, I, again, it, so, so thank you for sharing that. I, I, I think you might have mentioned a number actually probably a year ago this time we were talking separately about possibly using other funds to offset the cost of these groups, which I'm not a fan of doing. But the point is, the, question, the other question I had is, so the, the, you mentioned in the last budget presentation, the revenue that's budgeted for this year is approximately $10,000. That goes directly to the town general fund. That doesn't Correct. have the board of ed. So is there, I mean, I know we have a policy around this, but you know, what ha is there any repercussion if the board of ed doesn't charge for facility usage? If we don't charge? In general, it's like, uh, it doesn't seem like it's like a. It doesn't seem like it's our decision since it's a town revenue source, and ultimately, I think they're using that money to, you know, obviously put it back into building. So the, the point is, we get, I, you know, as we pour in the papers and so forth, that you know, the board can opt to not do certain things. Not, that's not necessarily true, uh, and we will have a, a much deeper discussion on this at some point because it is, it is my intent to work with town council to get these facts out there, right? Because I, I think you know. We hear stories and feedback and, and things and experiences that some are accurate, some are not very accurate. And there's a lot more detail that happens that the town council is not privy to. And I think you know it's worthwhile sharing this information for the new board members, refresh some of ours. But I won't get in tonight. But uh, you know, again, I think I, you putting this together is very helpful. Um, I'm going to make sure our town council colleagues have this information at their disposal to help you know on their side of things. But. I guess my, my question is I, I don't have an answer or solution to solving some of these scheduling problems or fee problems. I mean, uh, what you laid out was pretty, pretty straightforward. But uh, for the board, at some point, we'll, you know, we'll get into this a little deeper to mm -hmm. see where it goes. But, but thank you for putting this together. OK. Um, from a liability point of view, um, you mentioned um, that uh, our maintainers are, are certified in the bloodborne pathogen, and I'm assuming um, um, the liquid spills on, on the floors uh, throughout our buildings. Um, and so, does our liability insurance allow for someone other than a non certified person to sort of um, provide coverage to the buildings? I guess specifically on the weekends, because it seemed like you were, you were stressing that maintainers usually there during the, during the week, Monday mm -hmm. through Friday. Uh, but on the weekends, um, it's a, a specific expense because a maintain, maintainer normally wouldn't be there. Um, so there's that additional charge. So if 
if someone were to to be there that wasn't necessarily certified in those additional things, um, does that um, create an additional expense as far as in increasing our, our exposure to liability if someone were in the building and were to get hurt or to be injured or anything like that? I, I, there's a couple of um, points that I would make. I, I'm not sure that it would increase our liability and or our liability insurance cost. You know, I think we we would have to use reasonable care, and which we do, you know, as to whether or not to assign someone in our buildings. I mean, I don't think there's any insurance requirement that you have to have, you know, a building maintainer. In fact, I know that's not the case. But you just have to have reasonable control over the building. Building users also, outside building users, are required to provide a uh, million dollar certificate of insurance when they do use our buildings. So why Cheshire Travel Basketball, all the outside groups, that's just one of the requirements that they have. So really, a typical outside organization, their insurance would cover it, not ours. But again, I think that's a different issue than do we need someone in the building that's a building maintainer, or are we good based on the organization and the intended use to have someone you know, occupy a building without having a building maintainer? So is it a preference or is it mandatory that let's say there was an injury on the premises where normally you know, you know common sense would dictate well I'm just going to call 911 to have mm -hmm. you know paramedics arrive to, to help with the injury but the potential mess left over um, if if a maintainer weren't there who was certified to uh, clean these things up properly uh, what would happen in a, in a case like that I'm, uh, I mean, typically it's reported and the building maintainer, you know, whoever does the cleanup, the building maintainer will double back. <coughs> and if it's a disinfection issue, we'll do that at the time. I mean, we do have, you know, a good example, you know, if we have a, a park and rec, you know, building supervisor <coughs> in our building, they do communicate with our, our staff. We have an on-call uh, building maintainer too. There's someone on call for the schools at all times. And, you know, it's done on a rotating basis. They cover one week at a time. So we would get a call typically if there were an event after, you know, if, if there were an incident that required 911, that would obviously happen by whoever's in the building. But, you know, we, we do get communication as to what's happened in the building, and we would take, you know, treat it that way. So then in a, let's, let's call it a best case scenario, if we were to not, to no longer require maintainers to uh, be in the building on the weekend except for, let's say, an open close or a sweep or you know, a sweep of the area instead of being there the entire time, is, is that something that would be acceptable to us or not? Depends on the situation, but like I mean, if there the was someone who was adequately we, trained. We already do what we need to be doing. You know, there's a building maintainer when we need them there. So. Right, but at a, at a char, an additional charge currently. Because right, yes. normally there's not a maintainer there during the weekend unless there was an event, correct? Where right. we would be That's charging right. them yeah, to be there. Yeah, they'll come in on for an event. There's, right. They're not staffed on the weekend. Right, right. That's what I'm getting events. at, yeah. yeah. Normally the building would be closed or... But I would guess most weekends there is something going on anyway, right? Every the weekend, I would say, yeah. with a few exceptions. Okay. So, and again, I, what, I, what I'm saying to you, Adam, is that I feel that we're providing a building maintainer when we have to have one, you know, and, and moving away from that, you know, would really be a difficult thing for me to, you know, accept unless there's good reason to do that. Are um, any of these outside groups um, in arrears and what they owe us in terms of either custodial fees or building use fees? Um, we're up to date on last year. I, for this year, you know, we, we've certainly billed. We haven't collected everything that's been billed. So, but that's part of the, of the process. So the remedy is if someone doesn't pay their bill, uh, and that's part of the policy, that we don't have to allow them additional building access. 
So no one owes us anything for the last, last when you say the last? Last fiscal year. Okay. So you're, we're clear. Yes. I'll but this, this year, you know, the building users don't. Some, some are faster payers than others, as you would see, I guess, in any, any kind of business. But we do, you know, invoice and we follow up if we're not getting paid. Can you estimate how much you're owed? Right now? I'd, I'll provide it at the next board meeting. I'm, okay. It would be a wild guess. Okay. But our building use, just to, I guess, put some context around it, you know, our custodial fee billing last year, $45,000, and building use was about 13000 So I mean, that's our maximum exposure. Good on building use? All right. You want to do instructional expense? Yeah. All right, so the sections of the budget we have left are instructional expense, support services, maintenance and operations. I'll keep going until somebody tells me to stop, okay? So instructional expense, it's about 6.4% of our overall budget. You see on the bottom left there, the amount that's being requested is $4,855,169. It's about a 6.15% increase. The major categories that fall under instructional expense, special education tuition, you could see that's 2.2 million or about 46%. These are for students that we cannot service their needs in district, and we send them out of district and we pay tuition. That's what that particular category is. Um, and then the second largest category is special education pupil services, basically the consulting and other, you know, services that we provide in-house for our special education students. So those two, you know, account for about 63% of total instructional expense. The rest of special education, in, which is certified salaries, you know, including speech and language therapists, um, those are part of certified salaries, so these are just two specific sections of special education costs. Um, we will be talking more in more detail about special education. I believe that's being pushed to next Thursday's meeting. There is a presentation by Ms. Hussey. The other categories of instructional expense include instructional supply. Those are generally items that are supplied for our students, um, textbooks, software, Curriculum um, is about 11% of this total um, portion of the budget. New and replacement equipment, that includes furniture, um, any type of you know, office equipment that we have inside our school buildings. There is a, a small increase requested for those two categories. Staff training, library periodicals, media testing, and adult supplies. So if we look at this, based on what's in the budget book. Um, you could see line item by line item. I will say that um, staff training, um, a lot of that um, 214,300 requested is, is actually um, curriculum writing that is done during the summer months. Um, so, you know, the training is most of the professional development that we do is done in-house by our own staff. So we're not outsourcing and, and um, spending significant dollars in, in staff training outside. Pupil services and tuition outplacement, you could see those increases of 3.6 and 4.7%, which we talked about. Instructional supply, um, we're looking to increase that by 43,697. What I do want to point out is when we have budget reductions, um, Typically, these are some of the accounts that we will stop spending money on. So you could see down at the bottom, in this 2019 budget year that we're in, the 560, which is tuition outplacement, that account was reduced 50,000 because students' needs were lower when we completed the budget process than when we started. But the other accounts, the 611, which is instructional supply. You could see that we reduced that $60,000 for this budget year. 
So going up to 43,000 is less than it was cut for this fiscal year. And then those other accounts, textbooks, library, curriculum materials, library media supplies, testing supplies, um, and replacement equipment. If you look at the amount that those were reduced, those were reduced about $120,000 for this year's budget. So, you know, again, these are the categories that we typically um, have not been funding fully the last few years. As, as we've explained in the past, we always prioritize what are the things that we need with the funding that we have, and we'll continue to do that. But the, the bulk of the increase, you could see, falls in the tuition outplacement, instructional supply, textbooks, um, quite a bit of that is restorative. Any questions? I'm just going to touch on this, um, but if you look at the far right column, 2020-21, what this reflects, that 19174468 that's what's dedicated, if you look across the entire budget, to special education needs for the 2020-21 year. Um, and so if you take it as a percentage of the $76 million budget request, about 25% of the, of the budget is dedicated for special education needs. And then if you look at that um, bottom section of rows, we're anticipating that we'll have about 542 uh, students with individualized education plans for next year, even with, with this year is what we're saying, but that's likely to increase. In fact, I think it may have increased already for this year since we started preparing the budget. Um, the total percentage of students that have an individualized education plan, um, you could see is about 13 percent uh, projected for next year. It's 12.9 percent this year, and it has been increasing if you look back to the 11.2 percent in 2014-15. So, you know, even though our We've said it before, as our student enrollment drops, our special education population is not decreasing, hence the need for the additional funding. And then you can see the bottom is the expenditure per um, IEP student. So there'll be a lot more detail around this when Ms. Hussey presents on Thursday night. That's just a preview of her cover. So within Instructional expenses, just a couple of, um, couple of quick points. The Curriculum um, Council focus for 2020-21 is business, social studies, uh, academically gifted is AGP, uh, and school counseling. Um, um, some of the you know, funding in that curriculum writing will be for ne the next generation science standards college, career, and civic life, and then support for K-12 math, um, specifically Eureka for K-5, through five, Algebra 1, and Geometry. So this is what, um, you know, has been prioritized, you know, by our curriculum department led by Ms. Solano. Anything to add? Are you good? As far as instructional materials and resources that we're anticipating uh, purchasing, um, we have some uh, updates or replacements of textbooks for math. Um, again, in line with what you saw previously, Eureka, Algebra 2, and Geometry Text College Prep Level, um, as well as College Career and Civic Life for Social Studies. And then professional development for next year. These are some of the focus areas. Um, you know, continuing to focus on complex thinking, social emotional learning, including coaching and professional development for teachers and staff, um, the next generation science standards, and the K-5 math program. So again, pretty tightly wrapped around those core items. If we look at instructional expense as a percent of budget, um, historically you could see that we've been 
kind of flat, you know, bouncing up and down, you know, as a percentage of budget, you know, lower than we were back in, you know, 2000, 2001, a little over 7% of the budget. You know, the last few years we've been hovering around 6.5% of the total budget is dedicated for instructional expenses. And with more going to those special education lines, you know, basically what it tells you is that the non-special ed lines, you know, have, you know, dropped in terms of funding provided. Questions? Support services is next. So support services is about 8.9% of the budget. Uh, we're looking for a 2.51% increase this year. You know, far and away, the biggest portion of support service is that first line, $3.9 million is our student transportation, regular and special ed and student activities, uh, and that includes fuel and insurance. Um, you know, the next largest category is other professional services, so that includes expenses related to paying for uh, Apex, our network consultants on the technology side, fees that we paid for outside counsel, um, the audit that we do every year through RSM, that's you know, about $35,000. You know, some expenses related to Board of Education meeting all fall in other professional services. The energy performance contract, I'll talk about that very quickly. Uh, I guess it's six years ago, we um, entered into a contract with Amoresco. We did infrastructure upgrades to all our buildings, everything from the computer controlled LED lighting, replacing the electric heat at Highland School, the electric heat at the back of Cheshire High School. Those energy improvements are paying for themselves over a 15 year cycle. There is a loan or a lease associated with that and that's paid out of, you know, you know, this support services budget um, and it's roughly $600,000 per year, but the offset to that is savings in electricity, you know, natural gas, oil, and other energy related accounts. So we're saving the money on one side, but we're responsible for the school's portion of that payment for the energy performance contract, and we're roughly 80% of the contract the town paid the other 20%. And I'm going to skip over this so that we could jump right into this. So you'll see that other professional services, you know, we're requesting a $10,400 increase. In this line is where we're budgeting for the development of the uh, board strategic plan. So we did add some additional funding for that. Um, you could see pupil transportation is going up about 2.86%. The next slide is on pupil transportation. That's you know, generally in line with the contract we have. All the other line items are um, really kind of flat. Um, capital equipment, that 19,309, that's actually where we budget for the energy performance contract. And that increase is the contractual amount that we owe for that um, energy performance contract. And you could see that those accounts, 531, so communications, travel, other services, office supply, transportation supply, other supply, and dues and fees, we took a combined cut of 63,000 to those categories. So not quite as much as instructional services or instructional expenses were reduced in this year's budget, but certainly some. So with transportation, very quickly, if you look at the cost by category, 1.9 million of the total for transportation is our, our general ed public school routes. About 1.1 million is special education, you know, specialized transportation for those students. Fuel equipment and repairs is 365,000. That 205,681, that's for student activity, whether it's sports, music, uh, field trips, those types of events are uh, about 5%. Private school routes, that 202,000, we provide under Connecticut state law, transportation for St. Bridget's uh, private school students. 
Um, students that attend BOAG, um, Wilcox, and other schools in lieu of the high school or in addition to, that's about 141,000. And then we do have separate transportation insurance that we pay for out of this budget. Question? Yeah, uh, just about how many kids take the public school routes? Um, uh, hold on one second. We transport 3,500 total students per day, of which St. Bridget's is 104. So it's about 3,400 students. And that's regular ed transportation. OK, so, um, so taking out the special ed, you have what, 4,100 students total? I'm just curious, it's about, six, about 600 walkers and 3,500 busers, basically. Right. Uh, what is it, so is the 3,500, the, does that include like the high school kids who drive who are, I'm just curious. It includes Cheshire High School as well as the vocation, vocational and technical schools. Okay, so, and, a, and a number of those kids drive probably. Okay. So, so this so, is yeah, eligible riders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? No, They're not walkers, that. that doesn't mean they all take the bus. But yeah, yeah, The yeah. bus has to be made available for them. Yeah, absolutely, okay, okay. thank you. Welcome. Okay. Just a couple of things I want to mention regarding transportation. We are in um, the first year of our new contract with DATCO this year. Um, there was no increase in that contract as, as part of the agreement we have with DATCO, but next year we have a 2% increase by contract, and if you look historically, our last contract, we went up 3% a year on the contract before 4% a year, so DATCO really did work with us to get this new contract into place. And in addition to that, they've also equipped the entire fleet with uh, GPS so that the buses can be tracked. We could see speeds on buses. We could see, you know, did a bus in fact stop at a certain location? Um, all the DATCO buses are also equipped with internal video surveillance cameras, and then as part of this agreement, DATCO is funding the new depot um, facility. That there's a triple wide trailer replacing the double wide in the spring. Um, and we do everything we can to try and keep you know, the cost of transportation as low as possible. We do consolidate routes. A couple of years ago, uh, rather than offering summer school at, at multiple locations, we only offer summer school at Highland. You know, we've made some improvements to the route, so that saved us money. You know, we do participate in a, essentially a co-op with ACES for special education students that need to go to the outplace centers. So there are many things that we do to try and keep the transportation costs down as, as low as we possibly can. On the technology side, which is also part of the budget here for support services, um, just a few things. One, we completed this past summer the upgrade of our Wi-Fi. So we are you know, pretty much state of the art. We've expanded you know, the number of access points because we have so many Chromebooks um, that have been deployed now. We wanted to make sure that our coverage was adequate. The most important thing on this slide I do want to point out is you know, we try and take advantage of any kind of opportunity to reduce our costs. So these Wi-Fi upgrades, which we did over the last two summers, are eligible for E-rate funding. About 40% of the project cost is paid by the federal government. And so the $81,000 gross cost, uh, we got about $32,000 in E-rate funding. So our project cost was $49,000. So we are in great shape you know, with our network and with our Wi-Fi network. Um, we launched Safe Schools online training. Some of the training that I showed you that the building maintainers are taking advantage of is, is doing online through this, this platform, which is excellent. Um, we are doing our best, and we're in compliance with the student data privacy law, and we, in fact, upgraded the software to this Learn platform, 
And if you go on the uh, Tresha School's website, if you're interested in the software we use and whether or not it's got a privacy agreement and you want to see it, you can go right to our school website to see that. Uh, we finished, we almost finished with the video surveillance upgrades. So we're in the final phase of installing cameras. All the wiring was done over the summer and the cameras are still being installed, should be done uh, very soon. Um, all our PCs that are used in the district, typically by our administrative secretarial staff, as well as our teachers, because the PC drives the smart board in our classrooms, um, those have all, all been upgraded this summer to Windows 10. So we needed to make sure we were ahead of the expiration of support for Windows 7. Um, this DNS hosting, we outsourced that um, to the Connecticut Education Network that supplies our internet service. And we were actually struggling with it internally. So rather than, you know, replace the servers that were driving it, you know, it was uh, Mike Papa, our technology manager, you know, who's very active with the Connecticut Education Network. He serves on one of their boards, um, found that we could have this hosted. And it was done in a very short period of time and it's not costing us anything. So it was actually a, a terrific move and uh, we're not struggling with, with the things we were struggling with prior to that. Um, we talked about in our last budget presentation, our smart boards are 10 years plus um, and they are at the end of their usable life and the technology that's out there is something that we are exploring and we're piloting um, some interactive flat panels right now uh, actually the ViewSonics. And then the last thing um, that I want to mention is that we moved all our local laser jet printers to a cost per print program like our large multifunction printers and this is in, a, in an attempt to continue to reduce our printing costs and try and stop printing and I have some of the principals here that can attest to this is not an easy thing to do to you know take local printers off you know, a teacher's desk or force them to use a large, you know, machine that's not in their classroom to produce documents, but it has saved us money. Um, so it's been a good initiative, but not so simple to actually implement. With regard to the federal funding that you got, were there any strings attached? To the managed print? The top, no, the top line, the wireless oh. upgrade. Yeah, the strings are that you have to have very precise records of the equipment that's installed, but there's no penalty um, yeah, attachment yeah. if that's your question. Yeah, there's no strings. Honestly, I was just thinking about data. <laughs> what happens with the data? That was it. I didn't know if the federal government was saying, oh. we'll give you this money, and then you have to report all the no. you know, student user information back to us. No, 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 no. Okay, thank you. No. Um, I, I think the board's aware that we do everything we can to try and, you know, save money where we can so that we can spend it on the things that are important, that, that are educational. So I'm not going to belabor this point. Um, what was that? Well, I had to hit this one because I know this one's important. Um, but we talked about the energy performance contract. The other thing that we do to try and you know, keep our costs down or certainly you know, have a reasonable expectation of what our costs would be is wherever we can, we do try and lock prices. So you could see that we're locked on unleaded gas right now uh, through the end of next December at $1.65. It's a pretty good price. Um, and more and more of our vehicles are using gas. Um, we have 50,000 gallons of diesel fuel locked for our buses at $2.03. We do pay for the fuel for the buses, even though it's a contract with DACO. The reason we do that is because we don't pay tax as a school district. And if DACO purchased the fuel, they would pay tax, which means we pay the tax. So that's why we, we do that. But we're, we're locked at a pretty good price um, through the end of the school year. Heating oil locked at $2.02 .02 a gallon. Our electricity is locked at, this is just the electricity uh, supply at 7.38 cents per kilowatt hour. 
and that contract runs through 2022. And natural gas is the only commodity that we're not locked in because the pricing is just not that good. And we've done reasonably well. Yankee Gas is the natural gas provider in this area, so um, not having a contract has actually worked out a little bit better for us. What sort of, do you happen to know what sort of mileage you get for the school buses, miles per gallon? Um, on the diesel buses, below 10, but okay. I can get you some, some yeah, better that's estimates okay. than that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. They're large diesel engines, so the mileage is not that great. Yeah. Yes? What's that per capita value per year? Um, of that? Of the three nine million, it's like three million. point three point one or so. So the balance is in the fuel insurance. Yeah. And the contract with DACO is a per bus per day. So the you know type one, the large bus. You know when we run a bus, it's um, I want to say that this year's rate is about 331, but I'm not 100% sure of that. A Type 2, a smaller bus, is in the $270, you know, per day range. So, I mean, if you do that math times 180 days, you know, to the extent we can eliminate, you know, a bus route, it's about $55,000 in savings. And we have been able to do that over the years through some of the things that we've done, like route consolidation. The fact that student enrollment is down helps. So we're always looking to see what, what can we do. Any more questions on this one? Uh, the other things that you know, we do is um, you know, we take advantage of, we bid when we have to, but there are you know, state bids, consortium, purchasing groups. You know, we negotiate with our vendors all across our platform wherever we can. You know, we do apply, and we've been approved in all four rounds of school security grants here in Cheshire. Um, we have a couple of school construction grants that we're trying to get approved by the state right now. We use Amazon for you know, all the purchases where it's the lowest cost provider. We don't pay shipping fees. And then we use technology wherever we can to you know, improve our efficiency. If we look at support services as a percentage of budget, um, that big spike that you, could, you see occurred um, around 2011-12, a lot of that has to do with the energy performance contract that was instituted. So it drove this, this particular group of accounts up, um, but it leveled off on the operations and maintenance budget, which we didn't cover yet. Okay. That's support services. Um, I believe uh, in the interest of time, um, that will will end here this evening, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll table uh, maintenance and operations as well as um, the uh, special education presentation until uh, Thursday. Are you sure? I, I can keep going. No, I I, I think uh, <laughs> I I think we're okay. Uh, the, so um. Oh yes, go ahead. I would actually request that we continue through maintenance and operations in lieu of having yet another meeting to adopt the budget uh, next week, but that's just how I feel about it. Okay, uh, duly, duly noted. Let's just do it. Um, we could do that, but um, being that we are late into the evening already um, and that uh, we could have additional discussion uh, on that on Thursday, um, I'll, at least I'll ask for this. I would like to have a motion to table um, the operations and maintenance portion of the agenda as well as the special education presentation. I move that we table special education presentation and review of operations and maintenance until the Thursday budget meeting. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Second. All in favor? Uh, just us. Just the plaintiff. Yeah. All right. So moved. All right. So we're tabling those agenda items until Thursday, uh, January 23rd. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, I uh, hand the gavel back to you. Thank you, Mr. Gripple. Just a reminder, there, there will be a <clears throat> next meeting here is the DA, January 23rd, this Thursday. This is the uh, follow-up meeting to the remainder of the operating budget review and possible discussion from the Board Finance Committee on a budget number. If needed, on January 28th, um, next week, there'll be a special meeting of the Board of Education to adopt a Board of Education budget. We'll be stay tuned for that. We'll see how Thursday goes. That being said, I would ask for questions from the audience, but everyone's bundled up and ready to go. Uh, Jamie, do you, okay. Not to put you on the spot. Okay, and for those those folks that could not be here, that may be watching these videos, uh, I feel for you. It was at least a couple hours long, but thank you. If you do have questions, comments, concerns, ideas about the budget, please feel free to email any board member those questions. And if you wish to be anonymous, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, we'll honor that. We're all here to help answer, and we'll try to get those answers for the next meeting. That being said, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Adam, is there a second? Second. Andrew seconds. All in favor? Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.